We're joined today by John Brown, who's a physicist who spent much of his career working for national laboratories, including Lawrence Livermore National Lab and Los Alamos National Laboratory. He was the director of Los Alamos National Laboratory from 1997 to 2003. Welcome, John. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us here at SpyCast. Vince, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I'm not going to age you. Well, I might a little bit by saying this, but you, you kind of did your undergraduate and graduate work in the 1960s, which kind of look back historically as a historian of science, this is an exciting time for physics. This is where we're sending people into space and the, you know, we're having, in my world, we're having diplomatic confrontations focused on science and atomic weapons and other things like that too. Is this what really got you into physics? Because it seems like this would be the heyday for people being kind of dreaming for the stars. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. I remember vividly when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. My, my brother was uh, working at the time for GE Aerospace, and he and I went outside in our backyard and watched for Sputnik coming overhead. And he was an electrical engineer. My other brother was an aeronautical engineer, and so I was the youngest kid in the family. So I wound up going to Drexel in Philadelphia and they have a co-op program where you work six months and go to school six months and so when I got involved with that I wound up working on nuclear attack submarines at the young age you know 21 years old and it was a fascinating point for that for me for that period and and physics was really exciting at that, that, that time not that it isn't today it's totally fascinating to, to me. It's been a wonderful career. But uh, yeah, the 60s were an exciting time. It was a time of confrontation. You know, it was the end of nuclear testing above ground, and yet the Cold War was on full steam. And my experience with the nuclear attack submarines was really special to me because it was a response. Uh, growing up, I matured quite a bit in those four or five years with the responsibility of making sure this nuclear reactor on this submarine was going to work properly. Well, I mean, from my perspective, the 1940s kicked off this period where science was so integral to national security. And it just built from there and built from there. And so this 1960s is kind of that the generation that was born during World War II, the kind of the, or the baby boomer generation, kind of coming of age in a world where they're really the first generation going to grad school and working in the, in the world in the nuclear age, right? Everyone before them kind of, they were middle age or they were alive when it kicked in during World War II. Were you and your colleagues, your peer group, the people who were going to school with you, um, did you understand the world you were in? I mean, we look back at it historically and understand the 60s and the 70s and the 80s as being kind of this extraordinary period for physics and moving forward. Did you understand that at the time? Was it something that we kind of need historical hindsight to understand how innovative some of this technology was? Probably not. Yeah. We probably didn't understand it. I think we were really excited about the opportunities we had at that time. You know, the, the space program was really at its peak with sending a man to the moon. But ironically, when I got my PhD at Duke University, I, I stayed on and taught for a year, which was a great experience. But when I went out to look for a job in 1970, it, that whole period had sort of turned over with Nixon turning the money off from the space program. And the number of jobs available at that time was really diminished. So that was kind of a downer after this high of the 60s with the space race and you know everything was going on. But I was fortunate to get, get an offer to go to Lawrence Livermore Lab in 1970. But I, I think I didn't appreciate at that time how exciting a period it was until much, much later in my career. Well, we, we, we had talked earlier about who hired you at Livermore. Um, did you understand the person you were talking to was essentially a physics legend that or, I, that or I infamous? Did. Yeah. <laughs> that, that I did. Uh, you, you know, I'd been interview, I interviewed about four or five people and gave a talk at Livermore. And they said this interesting thing to me. They said, well, you know, we think we really would like you to join us. And I was all excited. And they said, however, you know, Livermore is going through a reduction in force right now, a significant one. We're letting a lot of people go. So if you're going to be hired, you have to be interviewed by Dr. Teller. And all of a sudden, you know, my 
heart started racing quickly. Uh, and, and the story is kind of fascinating. I went up to uh, Dr. Teller's office and uh, sitting out in his ante room were about 10 other young scientists all with long hair and sandals and you know, kind of the typical 1970 uh, period. So I got ushered into his office and he was sitting there with just the, what I expected he looked like with his bushy eyebrows and, and his deep voice and he said to me, look, I am very busy. Tell me what you've done in your career that's worth my knowing. Go to the blackboard, you have 15 minutes. And so I went up and I talked to him about the nuclear physics project I had done for a, my PhD thesis. At the end of 15 minutes, he banged the table and said, stop. And I thought, oh, I'm dead meat. I'll never get a job here. He said, look, this is very interesting. He said, I want you to continue because I'm going to use this today in my class at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> so he's already ready to steal your, your stuff and move from there. But it was typical, uh, you know, he told me something fascinating when he offered me, he said, you're going to get this job. And he said, you know, I think you'll fit here. But he said something very fascinating. He said, you're going to be hired into the physics division at, at Livermore. And he said, your job is twofold. It's to do the best science and publish the best science you can so that if we need your knowledge, in the nuclear weapons program, we will have it. And the Russians will know who you are oh. because you published and they'll know how good we are as a laboratory. I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, that's really interesting about yeah, the idea of... Walking that line yeah. between the open, unclassified science physics area and the classified physics area. And frankly, that's how my whole career uh, was carried out between both worlds. It's also interesting to look at the kind of juxtaposition between theoretical physics and applied physics and about some of these laboratories may do a lot of things that will never turn into anything, but they, they certainly don't poo-poo people just doing full-fledged basic theoretical physics because you never know. No, exactly. That's a very important point. You know, the, the, one of the important developments in the late uh, 70s was chaos theory. And that came out of a young man at Los Alamos who was a theoretical physicist who never, as far as I know, worked on nuclear weapons, but it was such a dramatic impact on a lot of applied programs that in retrospect, that was a tremendous investment that we made in that young man. That's not always appreciated by, by the people who fund research. Right. Well, I mean, that's what, I mean, we'll talk about this when you were become director of, of Los Alamos because one of the difficulties, and this is true in the intelligence world also, one of the difficulties is talking to policymakers and getting them to understand right. what you're doing and why you need to do it. And I think, you know, intelligence is difficult enough, but talking about physics at this level has to be an order of magnitude more difficult of sitting down with a member of Congress who might have a law degree or a per business person beforehand, and they want to know, what are you making for us? Versus, you know, I, I've... I have a little bit of a physics background, but I look at some of the stuff that you worked on and others and I just kind of chuckle, like it just looks like nonsense to me. And you'd have to have a lot of information to understand how that could be applied to something someday. How difficult was it, especially during the time of detente, you know, under Nixon and where nu nuclear weapons weren't, were being paired back during start and salt, to get funding for these kind of programs when you can't guarantee that at the end of a long process and millions of dollars that you're going to have a product to show. Yeah, that, that's very challenging. And I think that's, that's one of the things that scientists do need to do today as well as we needed to do back in that period. And that was to be able to explain it in terms that allowed policymakers or funders to basically say, yeah, yeah I trust this person's judgment because it's a judgment call. You know, a lot of it, for example, uh, in times when we wanted to build a new facility or new capabilities, a lot of money. And people say, well, do we really want to spend 50 or 100 million dollars of taxpayers' money on something like this? And we had to be able to explain, look, the impact of this isn't going to be tomorrow or next year. It's going to be 10 years in the future or maybe 20 years in the future. 
And a lot of times people had trouble saying, do we really want to make that investment? And my answer always was, do you want to have really smart people working on our nation's security 10 or 20 years in the future? And if the answer is yes, then you have to make the investment now right. because you can't make an expected overnight return on that investment. I mean, that's the interesting thing also is, is both the intelligence community, but even military procurement, they're saying, well, we can't just turn it on magically if we need people tomorrow. Exactly. You know, this is, I mean, science especially, you need to start breeding people at the high school level if they're going to be PhDs one day and moving forward. I mean, if people, Vannevar Bush wrote about this a lot at the end of World War II about don't cut off the spigot, right? Don't cut off the funding because we need to keep educating new scientists. Actually, that's probably right around, probably his programs led to a lot of what you were doing in the 1960s. So um, that had to have been hard to explain, right? I mean, this is also something where, forget explaining high-level scientific concepts, but explaining the investment that you're going to have to make. And that's something that we still have to make in scientists, you know, because they may not pay off for 30 years. Well, that's true. And, and what we saw, again, looking back over that period, we see ebbs and tides of support for this. Mm. Sometimes people would say, yes, we understand, and, and the money would flow, and then there would be a hiatus for three or four years, and we try to explain that that's probably the worst thing that can happen to you is, is you can't sustain things right. with people not knowing whether they have a job the next year or whether their research is funded beyond you know, the next continuing resolution in Congress or something like that. In 1979, you made an, what people may not think of as an interesting move. You went from Livermore to Los Alamos. Uh, there's a a perception within the community that, 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 that Livermore and Los Alamos kind of like jets in the sharks from West Side Story, that there's a very healthy rivalry between the two labs. Uh, is this overblown or is, is this somewhat true? No, I think it, it certainly was more true at that time than I think it is today, but, but there's still the remnants of uh, a competition and it was a healthy competition and I think the country really benefited from the disagreements between the technical approach that was taken on, on really tough problems, tough, you know, technical problems. Uh, I didn't move there because I favored one lab or the other. Uh, it was an opportunity that was offered to me by uh, a friend of mine who I went to graduate school with. His name is Jay Keyworth, who eventually became President Reagan's science advisor. But at the time, he was the head of the physics division at Los Alamos. And I was very happy at Livermore. I was doing quite well. I got a, had a good research program, you know, everything was going well. But he offered me the chance to run a research group. And it was a group that dated all the way back to the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of a lot of history, and I knew of this history. And I went and talked to them, and I said, you know, this is probably a little bit of a challenge, but I was 37 years old at the time. So it was a big deal, right? Uh, but I took it, and it was a, a great move for me uh, from a scientific perspective because we were able to develop some new research directions for Los Alamos out of that group, and personally, it gave me a chance to see whether I could run a research group or right. not. That's not a definite given. So it was it was a definitely good move. But I kept all my friends at Livermore, even though we were competitive. We were friendly competitive. Right. Well, the 1980s was a time of real optimism when it came to the abilities to go way beyond. And some people might call it pie in the sky thinking. Some people might call it optimism. I'm thinking of stuff like Reagan and SDI and some of the, you know, this is the time of the space shuttle. This is the time of, you know, really kind of reaching a little bit like we do in the 1960s where lots of money was going into research. I mean, talking about trillions of dollars that was spent slash wasted, depending on your perspective, mm -hmm. on some of this stuff. And this is when you move to Los Alamos. So that this had to have been, was there anything you could ever ask for that you wouldn't get at this point under Reagan? I mean, this seems like this is a time when you could really think about doing some interesting things that you could never, think about budgetary was the limitation beforehand. Were the, were the gloves off at this point? Pretty much. It really was true. It, it was an incredibly exciting period. 
<laughs> yeah, it was a quite an exciting period. Uh, when Jay Keyworth left to go to work for, with Reagan as a science advisor in 1981, the director of Los Alamos at the time was Don Kerr, who you probably know from your intelligence background, was a deputy director mm -hmm. of the CIA and, and then deputy director of national intelligence also. And Don was director of Los Alamos and he appointed me to be physics division leader in 1981. I had just turned 39 years old and all of a sudden I had 400 people working for me you know, across an incredibly diverse set of physics backgrounds. But that was the most exciting period of my life. I mean, more opportunities. We, we were actually working on SDI type ideas before President Reagan's talk. So it wasn't a surprise right. to us. Uh, you mentioned the X-ray laser. Um, I was skeptical about the X-ray laser, not because I didn't think you could make an x-ray laser work even driven by a bomb or maybe even with some other energy source but i i had a hard time understanding how it was going to be weaponized into something that was practical right you know i mean you're setting off a large nuclear explosion in space to create something to knock down a nuclear weapon it just somehow i, I had trouble appreciating the value of that however when livermore started that program I started a comparable program at Los Alamos on X-ray lasers, and the reason was this competition. Right. I wanted to be able to keep Livermore honest. And so we did tests in Nevada, just like Livermore did, and we had differences of opinion about their results and our results. So it was healthy, I think. Uh, that turned out to be a really political hot potato, right. the X-ray laser. But there were a lot of other exciting things that we worked on uh, at Los Alamos at that time. We were working on free electron lasers, neutral particle beams. There were ideas for uh, directed energy concepts that flowed out of those, some of which I think you're very aware of, like brilliant pebbles. Right. Uh, so it's always a fascinating time. And ironically, this gets back to my point about the value of basic science at the same time you're doing this defense science. What's going on at our laboratory at the same time is high temperature superconductivity. We also were very heavily involved in the embryonic work on the Human Genome Project. Most people do not understand that the national labs right. helped drive that because we had the ideas and some of the people who could think about, can you really sequence you know, something that's that large. Right. And a lot of biological scientists at the time were kind of, eh, that's kind of pie in the sky too, but our people weren't afraid to ask the question. So anyway, it was a very exciting time. Let me ask you, in 1986, you were made the Associate Director for Defense Research and Applications. And this has a, you know, a very basic name, kind of a, I think there's a lot of euphemisms probably in here. It's, it's obscure, but in many respects, you, you were responsible for a lot of programs that were funded by DOD and the IC. So I, I'm sure there's only so much you can talk about because we're not that far removed from this. But in a basic sense, this is really where we're talking about applied research for defense and I don't care more about the intelligence side. Um, are we talking about things like measurements and signatures intelligence, like Masson? Are we talking about things that are, like you just mentioned, SDI? Or are there uh, things we haven't quite mentioned that you could talk about without breaking any laws? <laughs> I certainly won't do that. Uh, no, you're correct. They, they were the types of uh, inserting new uh, technology into ideas that were already existing in the intelligence or community, or in sometimes giving them new ideas for them to basically evaluate, would it be of value to them in the kinds of programs that they have. Uh, some of them turned out to be highly classified and remain so to, the, to today because they were so successful and we don't want to give away. Right, yeah, sources and methods, this. right? Right, but it, that was to me very exciting because they were very appreciative and we had people who were both good at analysis, at looking at what somebody else was doing and evaluating and providing input to the intelligence community, at the same time developing some new ideas for technology that they could insert right. and 
it's this val what we used to call the valley of death. How do you get from the research phase into the actual product that is in a package that can be used by somebody? And getting through that is really tricky. And the national labs, uh, not all of them, but most of them like that prototype demo of technology that they can work with somebody that then makes it into an actual practical device. The intelligence community, it was actually easier than most times because they were willing to take demos more than the Department of Defense. Right. They wanted a packaged product that fit on something perfectly, whereas the intelligence community could say, if it works, we can figure out how to make it, use it in the field, so to speak. We never were in the field. That was not our job. Our, our job was to provide ideas and actual products that they could try out. It was a fun time, very exciting. You, you hinted at this actually in your answer, but how much, at this point, how much did you start focusing on what adversaries were doing? How much did you start, again, you can only say as much as you can say, but this seems like a job or at least a relationship to where you start thinking about maybe not neutralizing science from other countries, but at least understanding, you mentioned analysts, that you had people that looking at other things, understanding without mirror imaging, right, without saying, you know, certainly they're not going to do it exactly the same way we are, but I would assume the IC would want to talk to you guys to try to understand what Soviet, the Soviet equivalent of Los Alamos or, or Livermore is doing. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. And we, we had some people who were quite good at in-depth analysis of their open literature, which you'd think, well, the Soviet Union was pretty tight during that period. But some of our people were good enough to see signs of not only what they were doing, but where they were doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the first times we found out where their so-called secret cities were through open literature. And that was a way of providing the intelligence community with really good analysis that they were able to act on. Uh, you know, that that's probably one of the hardest things is not to mirror image. Right. And I think we've, we've all seen that period. Uh, what we did during that period was also interesting. It was the first times we started getting involved in counterterrorism. Mm. Even though it wasn't on the radar screen as big, we had some people that we interacted with who were already saying this is an upcoming problem. What can we do about it? And they were asking us for ideas of countering mm -hmm. terrorist activities. And particularly because of our background in nuclear weapons, what if they get their hands right. on material or so on. And that became a much bigger problem when the Soviet Union fell apart. Well, that's a great, you led me to the transition I was going to go to next about the end of the Cold War, because I've talked to a ton of people about the peace dividend and how it affected them, whether they're in the DOD or they're in the intelligence community and how things changed dramatically at the end of the Cold War. You would think at a laboratory that was created to make nuclear weapons, um, how much of an impact the end of this struggle was, this Cold War period. Did you see an immediate impact? Was there a peace dividend, so to speak, for national labs when the Cold War ended? No, as a matter of fact, the opposite. We saw the opposite. From 1988 on, our budgets, the bottom fell out of our budgets. And there were questions being asked about whether we needed three weapons laboratories or not. Or maybe we need to channel them into other areas rather than nuclear weapons or national security issues. So there were a lot of studies. There was a famous Galvin uh, report. Bob Galvin was the head of Motorola, the family. And he chaired a, a report that basically talked about remissioning the, the weapons laboratories. And it wasn't until um, Vic Reese, who became the Assistant Secretary of DOE for National Security Programs, Defense Programs. Uh, I had known Vic when he was Director of DARPA, and then he was the DDR&E in, in the Pentagon, and he was a brilliant guy, incredible strategist. That, that's what he was incredibly talented at. He came in and saw this decline, and you know, if you did the projection on a graph, it'd say we would be out of business in like 1995 mm -hmm. or 1996 if something wasn't done. This was like 1993. 
So Vic got people from the three weapons laboratories together, and I was fortunate enough to be one of them. He called us the navigators. And our job, he said, if we want to find out where we want to go, you have to navigate your way to right. there. So anyway, that's how the science-based stockpile stewardship program got its start. And uh, if it hadn't been for that, I'm not sure what would have happened to the defense laboratories, because there was not a lot of sympathy in the country because we had been so well funded in the 1980s. The rest of the country was, a lot of them were saying, let them go out of business, right? right? How much was the treaty verification or the loose nukes worry in the early 90s with all the different republics and trying to account for all the Soviet nuclear weapons? Were, were, were the national labs involved in any of that kind of brain drain problem and all those ideas that kind of everyone freaked out about when the Soviet Union collapsed and people didn't know where all the nuclear material was or where all the nuclear weapons was and all of a sudden there were a lot of countries that ended in stand that had nuclear weapons that we were a little worried about that bordered Iran. Was that a program, maybe not for you particularly, but for the broader national lab system or was that something else? No, we were very heavily involved in that, and, and I have to give credit to my predecessor, uh, Sig Hecker, who was director before me. Uh, he actually got the Department of Energy, uh, at the time the Deputy Secretary was Charles Curtis, and he made the case that it was perfect time for us to reach out to our counterparts in Russia, the Russian labs and have lab-to-lab -lab interactions. And when we did that, it, it was right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The first visit occurred, I think, in February of uh, 1990, or, yeah, 1992. Mm -hmm. And what they found when they were, were over there was frightening. They said, their security is, it's guns and guards, right. but that's falling apart. And so there are other types of uh, security that we had on our weapons and nuclear materials was missing in the Soviet Union. So, yeah, actually there was a very uh, significant program that all the labs participated in, but it got started with this lab-to-lab -lab between Los Alamos, uh, Livermore, and Sandia with mm -hmm. their counterparts. And they got in to see for the first time what some of these cities looked like. They were closed cities, and uh, it resulted in real programs that our country funded, and uh, Senator Nunn and Senator Luger were very heavily involved in, in funding that and making the case for, for that. But it had a significant impact. It, it actually wound up, I think, preventing you know, serious loss of nuclear material or even potentially actual weapons during that period. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of criticism of the way that we've created command and control and safety issues. I mean, Eric Schlosser's book, Command and Control, really stands out. But we have things like PALS, like Permissive Action Link. We have things like, you know, redundant systems to protect them from being stolen or misused. The Russians didn't have any of that. I mean, to and, and so, I, you know, I, I can imagine how terrifying that would be going in there. I mean, everyone kind of chuckled. I remember this. The modern, the mass media was like, oh, their silos are full of water and they couldn't hit anything. It's like, well, that's the, that's the scary part, right? Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I think when, it, when a country was suffering as much as they were during that period, uh, I got to visit uh, when I was laboratory director and, and was still amazed that they weren't being paid. These scientists, you know, were food on the table was a big issue for them. And you know when you're trying to feed your family, it can create situations where perhaps uh, nuclear smuggling could occur. Right. And if you don't have the things in place to prevent it, heck of a lot easier. Well, let's, let's, let's transition to you as lab director. You were, the, I believe, the sixth lab director. Let's have yes. you talk a little bit about the history when you got there. Was this something where the first lab director of Los Alamos was... Robert Oppenheimer during the Manhattan Project. Was this something that you kind of understood? This You weren't like the 50th director, right? You were, it's, it's, you know, you just need one finger on the other hand to talk about the separation between you and Oppenheimer. Um, was this something that you kind of, when you sat in that chair and said, oh my God, I'm sitting in Robert Oppenheimer's chair? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that really had a major impact. And I knew what I was getting into because I had been at the laboratory long enough and had been at a high enough level in the management to understand what the challenges 
were, but, but also the importance of the job. And, and you're correct, it wasn't so far removed from that period. And, you know, I got to know some of the early pioneers, and in particular, Harold Agnew, who was uh, a director, the third director, uh, became a very important advisor to me. Even though he was retired, mm -hmm. I would talk to Harold about a lot of issues because he was there during the Manhattan Project and flew on the mission that, that dropped the first uh, atomic bomb. So yeah, it, it, it's, it, it is a heavy weight, frankly, because mm -hmm. even though there are other national laboratories that do nuclear weapons work, Los Alamos was still the lightning rod for that type of weapon in our country, because we were the first. Right. And so there was a lot of history there that was important to understand in doing the job. You, you mentioned the phrase stockpile stewardship, and I want to talk about that because I think our listeners may not know what that means. And, and my interest toward it is when atomic, when above ground, when atmospheric atomic testing ended in uh, 1963, essentially right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had to come up with very innovative ways to make sure our nukes worked and how do we modernize them without being able to test them. Uh, how do we make sure that they are, uh, if you need to push the button, that they're actually going to go off and do their job, not necessarily are they going to launch from point A to point B. That's the rocket scientist problem. But it's that when they get to their destination, they actually do what they're intended to do. You are now, you know, when you're the director, we're talking about 30 years of not being able to do atmospheric tests. Mm -hmm. And again, for full disclosure, we're literally saving having this conversation at the National Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas, which focuses on these tests. How much of a challenge was that, particularly when you're looking at the need to modernize some of these weapons because they, you know, Minutemen 3 at the point that your director had been around for decades. And, you know, the MX was an attempt to do this. But the MX program really kind of gets slashed in the 80s. How difficult is it to do this science without the ability of doing anything other than subcritical tests and computer simulations, all that? Well, you know, when we uh, switched to underground nuclear testing, even that was a change from atmospheric testing because the configuration is different. You're, you're underground, uh, very deep, and you, you have to calculate what's the effect of having not the same thing as you would have during an actual wartime scenario. So that was possible, though. You could do that because you actually were measuring mm -hmm the weapon going off or not going off or going off at a different value from you expected. In, uh, in 1992, when President Bush announced a moratorium on nuclear testing, period, no more nuclear testing, he's also said no more nuclear weapons types. You know, he froze mm -hmm. what we were doing at the time, no new designs. Uh, that was a year after um, the Russians had declared a moratorium on nuclear testing. A lot of people don't realize, I think it was unilateral on our part, it was not. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time I became director in 1997, uh, the Stockpile Stewardship Program had been formed, as I said, by Vic Reese and then President uh, Clinton, you know, actually officially declared it the way we were going to certify our nuclear, t uh, nuclear weapons in the stockpile without testing them was through this stockpile stewardship program. Uh, the Senate, if you remember, held uh, test ban treaty hearings in 1999, and one of the questions that we were asked, the lab directors, was, can you guarantee that you can certify the safety, reliability, the security of these weapons without testing them using all of these tools? And our answer was, we can't guarantee. You know, science usually doesn't guarantee right. anything. We're highly confident if you're willing to support the development of the tools necessary to underpin the stockpile stewardship program. So uh, an alternative question which was asked by one of them was, so what if we give you a couple tests today that'll validate your stockpile stewardship program? And our answer was, that's not going to validate it. We don't have the tools today. We just started this program. There are facilities that need to be built. Right. There are computers that need to be developed and so on. Now, here we are 25 years after it, frankly, and the question still is being asked about 
how can you certify something if you never test it? Right. You know, think about an airplane that you're flying back to Washington on. What if somebody did a computer simulation and said, okay, you're the first guy that's going to fly this back to Washington. How confident can you be? Right. You know? So that's the, oops, that's the challenge that, that we face and still face today. Uh, I certified uh, the weapons Los Alamos has in the stockpile. There were five of the seven weapons. Uh, every year from 1997 until uh, my period as director was over. And it was challenging because we did a surveillance program where you take some weapons apart and look inside. And what you would find is certain parts age. Right. You know, they corrode or they don't, they're not actually built the way you thought they were built. So we had to be able to analyze those. So is that going to make a difference or not? In a few cases, we actually rebuilt parts of the weapon because they weren't, we didn't think they would work the way they were supposed to work. Putting a new weapon into the stockpile, if it's a brand new weapon where it's never been tested before, I think is the biggest challenge. There are some people who are confident in that, others who have no confidence in that. What we're doing today is essentially refurbishing all the original weapons that were in the stockpile. But we're refurbishing them by remanufacturing parts, by reusing old parts where we can. So it's a really different situation than a lot of people understand. They think we're rebuilding the whole stockpile with new weapons. And so far, that's not been true. Well, and I think people think, oh, if nuclear weapons are very advanced. There's the plutonium and there's the, but there's, there's basic stuff you'd find in a car or a computer, right? These are they're, they're cords, they're electrical connections, they're basic mechanical things that break all the time in our daily lives that are going to be a trigger or something else like that. It's not just the plutonium and the weapon. It's all the random crap that surrounds it that in 10, 15, 20 years is going to go bad no matter if it's a nuclear weapon or if it's a computer. Well, that's certainly true, and uh, some of the fortunate things we have is some of that can be tested. Yeah. And Sandia has a responsibility for a lot of the engineering components in a weapon. They're able to test them, but they're not always able to test them under the conditions that they might face in, in an actual use. So that, there's a challenge for them as well. The bigger challenge, I think, is the things like, you know, some people say plutonium will last for hundreds of years. Other people will say including my old boss, Sig Hecker, would say, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. There are issues with it. But those are important questions to be able to understand well enough that you can still certify. Right. Well, it's great. I mean, plutonium literally hasn't existed for 100 years. That's correct. Right? That's so correct. it's until the 2040s, yeah. we actually won't know for sure yeah. if plutonium lasts for 100 years. That That's how new this technology is in many cases. In the middle of your time as director, a new organization was stood up under the Department of Energy that maybe people don't know a whole lot about. That's the NNSA. Um, extra N. A lot of my listeners will understand the NSA. Tack, tack an N on the front and then change the mission completely. This is the National Nuclear Security Agency. Um, how much interaction did the labs or did you as lab director have with the NNSA? Oh, quite a bit. Yeah, because they, our mission fundamentally was their mission. And so the interaction between the, the first director, for example, was John Gordon, who was a deputy director of the CIA uh, in the late 90s. Uh, John was a wonderful guy to work with, and um, so was his uh, successor, Linton Brooks, who was also very well known, Ambassador Brooks. Uh, they were very closely involved with the laboratories in planning and trying to help us live in a new organization, which was supposed to be a quasi-independent administration within the Department of Energy. And it led to a lot of conflict, in my opinion, a lot of duplication, of oversight, and who did you really listen to? Mm -hmm. And we had a zillion audits when I was director by different people, some from NNSA, some from DOE. But overall, you, you know, they tried very, very hard to make that transition as smooth as possible. I would say, uh, was it the best thing for our country? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. 
and, and that's meaning no disrespect to the people who run it today or have run it in the past. It's just, it's not obvious to me that the country benefited dramatically from the creation of that administration. You actually gave a, a testimony to Congress in 2000 where you focused a lot on science and secrecy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that fascinates me because, you know, we, we look at that kind of secrecy angle all the time. Uh, and then, you know, this is a debate that goes back to the Manhattan Project and even before that, the idea of science being international, science being universal. Basic science is not necessarily something that might be relegated to national security or to us versus them. Uh, you, you state clearly that you don't see that there is a, a tension, or maybe there, tension is the wrong word, you don't see that it's mutually exclusive that we can have science that benefits mankind and make be smart about keeping important things secret. Yes, I, I, I think that is still my opinion today. And, and the reason for that is the number of things that are, should be truly secret in our country, that where it affects our national security, should be limited to the things that we know. If that gets out, it's going to impact our ability to, to, to defend our country, etc. There are a lot of things that are classified simply because it's easy to classify them, right? Somebody yep. puts a stamp on it, it's classified. Whether that's in the country's best interest is debatable, I think. There are things that other countries are developing in parallel with us that are published in the open literature. And so if we're asked, what do you think of this development in China or Russia or wherever, you have to say no comment, even though the rest of the world is basically doing the same kind of work. The question I always ask myself is, are we really protecting anything with, with that kind of thing? I mean, giving out the dimensions of a weapon or how it works, or what, well, obviously that, that's got to be very tightly protected. But I, I don't think the people at the laboratories, most of them, ever had a problem distinguishing between what was really scientifically valid and open versus what they knew they had to protect. I, I don't think they had a dilemma saying, oh my God, how am I thinking about this today? I think most of us pretty much knew. It, it was a gut feeling, you know, this this is pretty much should be open. and But we didn't determine that. That was determined by the government, what got classified. And right. the classification guides, and we followed them very religiously. And we count for the documents, etc. But I didn't have a personal opinion, and I don't think my colleagues did either, with walking that same line between the classified world and the open world. So uh, this is not necessarily the most natural segue into what I want to ask you about finally. Uh, while you were director, um, there's an, a name the audience may know a little bit, uh, was, was caught up in some kind of a controversy. I'm going to use the word controversy on purpose so I don't get sued. Uh, Wen Ho Lee. Uh, was a Taiwanese scientist, worked at Los Alamos, who was arrested, I believe, and indicted 50-something counts of espionage, of giving information about American nuclear weapons to the Chinese. Uh, unfortunately, you know, if you look up your name on Wikipedia, this takes up a big chunk of it, right? Uh, this has been, for a long career, something that has come to kind of be part of your bio. Um, and you can only say so much about this also because there was a settlement and all the things like that too as well. In general, even if we don't talk about Wen Ho Lee specifically, um, counterintelligence has to be a primary focus of not only your lab, but also throughout the complex. Um, how much was this a wake-up call or were, were the labs already really focused? I mean, the separation between Klaus Fuchs and Wen Ho Lee, not that I couldn't put them in the same thing because don't sue me. Um, there had been a brief, uh, basically an, a long period in the middle where there weren't a lot of spy scandals coming out of the national labs. And then you have one that's this big. Yes. Was this a way that, that the government and you guys were able to refocus your efforts on counterintelligence and moving forward? Well, I think you phrased it properly. It really was a wake-up call. And, and I think we were first in denial that it was a problem. But it, after uh, we understood what had happened in this case, here we had a person, Wen Hu Lee was a citizen, 
he was from Taiwanese mm -hmm. descent, but he was a citizen. He was an insider. He had a Q clearance, the highest clearance we had. And he worked in the weapons program on computer codes. To me, I don't know whether he was a spy or, or not, and uh, he was punished for his actions by spending time in jail, and he was eventually only convicted of one of the 59 counts. However, I always felt that his violation of the security that I grew up with and all my colleagues grew up with, he violated it. And the way he violated it was he downloaded the classified computer codes used to design our nuclear weapons, plus all the input decks that told you how to build those weapons. The sad part was that we didn't think that anybody would do that because right. we trusted insiders. And this is where we learned in counterintelligence the world had changed. Computers had changed things. It used to be we had classified documents that we all accounted for in our, in our safes. Well, now they were all in high density disks and hard drives and so on. And by the way, now the internet's coming online, right? right? And so I think we all of a sudden had this uh, issue of not just the insider threat, but are other people able to get access to our computer systems that we thought were, you know, air gapped and so on. Mm -hmm. And we found out that there were vulnerabilities and things that had to be fixed. So it was a wake-up call. It's sad that it happened that way. Uh, you know, there was a report written um, by the uh, President's uh, Intelligence Committee that said science at its best, security at its worst. And that was the title of the report. That was really damaging to mm. us. Ironically, uh, Ernie Moniz, who eventually mm -hmm. became Secretary of Energy, was Under Secretary of Energy at the time, and I remember him talking to me. He said, "You know, John, the problem with that report is neither one of those statements is true." <laughs> and and it was correct. Our security wasn't the worst. I mean, we had lots of security, and so it wasn't like people could walk through the gate right. of Los Alamos and walk into the design division and take stuff. However, we did have vulnerabilities, and we found those, those out. The sad part for me was the reason the, the government, I think, mishandled the case was the lack of communication between the FBI, the Justice Department, the CIA, the DOE was terrible. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a, an analysis done, the famous report called the Bellows Report, uh, that documents in great detail all the mistakes that were made. And, the only reason I, I want to mention that is I think it's important we learn from mistakes, right? right? And that, that's the thing people should be aware of. I certainly found myself in an awkward position where the day, I was, the day before I was going to take over from Sig Hecker as director, we had a, what we called passing of the keys mm -hmm. meeting, right? And he was telling me everything's going on, this, that, and the other. The last thing he said to me, and, oh, by the way, the FBI thinks we have a spy in Los Alamos. And I said, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? And so he said, well, you better talk to our counterintelligence person, Bob Roman, who I knew really well. And I said, oh, my God. So when I found out and, and got to talk to people in the local FBI office in Albuquerque about this, and I met with them regularly, it was low priority to them. Yeah. And I couldn't get action out of them. I said, can't you do something? I need this guy sitting in our design division. You know, I want to know whether I can take, oh, take him out or not. Well, I go and get phone calls from Washington saying, don't take him out. That's going to screw up our case, you know, and say, oh, well, look, I'm in an awkward position here. Right. I mean, it's one thing to kind of, if people aren't doing any damage, to follow them and kind of build a case. It's another thing if the guy is literally sitting in the nuclear weapons design division at Los Alamos, you got to be a little bit more worried about access to that kind of information. And of course, this is not your fault. You didn't give him the Q clearance. You didn't do the background check on this guy. You're, you're putting him in a position because you've assumed that he's been vetted by others. I mean, I think that's the trick where there has to be communication. There has to be agreement because the people doing the clearing process, the people doing the investigation process, are not the same people that are trying to protect this information. 
Well, that's true. And, you know, we found out after the fact, which is always a problem, that he had been under investigation by the FBI several times. And they never shared that with us. Mm -hmm. And there was a case at Livermore in the, like, 1980 time frame that was comparable to what he was being accused of, similar. I found out about it in 1987 by chance, by being part of a briefing set so-called farm, where they were telling us about these problems that had arisen, but they never mentioned that Wen Ho Lee had contacted the Livermore scientists out of the blue, and they were recording it, they had tapped his phones. And so, how are we to know how to do our job if we don't have the information right. to, to do our jobs? And I don't want to blame them totally either, but it, it, it was unfortunate. Uh, one of the things I was told after this was all over, they said, well, you know, you were the victim agency. You could have basically done whatever you wanted. And I said, well, it wasn't presented that way to right. me. It was presented to me that uh, I, I would be charged with obstruction of justice if I tried to take him out of his position. It was a real learning process for the lab. It was very damaging to the lab. It was very damaging to the Asian community at the lab because the implication was you couldn't trust Asians. Right. That there was always some kind of a connection back to that. Yeah. That's right. And we some people left the laboratory, and I spent a lot of time as director interacting with the national Asian community, trying to tell them, look, we're not trying to target Asian people. On the other hand, I have no problem saying that his security violation was the worst one I ever saw in all the years I spent at Livermore in Los Alamos. And the really scary part to me is he created 14 high-density tapes of the most classified nuclear weapons information at that time. And he was given this one count with the understanding that he would cooperate and tell them where the tapes were. And after that happened, he said, I threw them in a dumpster. Well, I don't know if you know this, but the FBI had people dig up the entire Los Alamos National Laboratory dump. Can you imagine the scale of that? People out there digging for months, they never found anything. Where did those 14 tapes go? Right. We don't know today. We do not know. Some people uh, commented and said, you know, this was uh, going to hurt national security forever because people could use this to design their own stockpile. I don't think that's the case. I mean, I don't think the Chinese, Chinese are very smart people. And, and I think they might have benefited from some of the information, but they weren't going to use our codes to design their nuclear weapons. Why, why would you do that? And it's, it's very, assuming they don't know how to do it on their own anyway. And I think that's a stupid assumption to make. No, you, you know, I had the, I was able to visit China in 1985 and, and it was clear how they operate. Uh, in an intelligence perspective. They were very kind to me and had a good interaction, but they asked me lots of questions that I said I can't answer mm. because they're classified. But what I was able to determine was the quality of the people I was talking to, because we also talked about scientific issues. And uh, those, those scientific issues told me that they were some of the smartest people equal to anybody in that mm -hmm. laboratory. And, and I got to talk, for example, to Yu Min, who was their Edward Teller. And they asked me an interesting question. They said, why do you maintain your contacts with the universities? Why don't you just keep people bottled up in your weapons laboratories and let them do their work? And we said, because we get the benefit of all of the access to new information. Yep. And they just sat back and looked at like a light bulb went on. They had not thought through that whole episode. But they are very smart people, and they clearly solved a lot of problems on their own. Are they trying to use whatever means they can to find out what we're doing? Of course they are. I think they're different than the Russians were in, in, in spying. I don't think they tried to run spies. I think they tried to do like they did with Wen Ho Lee and every other, but they tried to see what they would tell them. Right. And I knew they tried to ask me a lot of questions. Wen Ho Lee went to China I think three times. But when he came back, he told our counterintelligence officer they didn't ask him any questions. And I was flabbergasted, mm. you know, because I knew what they were 
course they asked him questions. After he failed his polygraph, he said, yes, they did ask me questions, and it came out that, in fact, was he a spy? Who knows? Right. I don't think we know today. But I still think the security aspect is, is an important one. Well, John, thank you so much for your time. Uh, fascinating conversation. Hopefully we can have one in the future again. There's a lot more questions I want to talk about, uh, particularly as we're now moving into a period of conversations about modernization and kind of our nuclear weapons arsenal for the next 20, 30 years, and we didn't even get to that. So yeah. hopefully we can do this again in the future. We really appreciate your time on SpyCast. Yeah, my pleasure, Vince. Thank you.